Good evening. The latest newsletter is now ready, and of course, I'll give you the address at the end of the programme, as usual. Last month, there was a total eclipse of the sun. Unfortunately, it wasn't visible from here. It was from Indonesia, and I went to the island of Java, where, together with hundreds of other astronomers, I found myself on the beach at Tanjung Kodok, and we did have a very good view. Uh, there's a picture I took of the partial phase. You can see the moon biting its way into the sun. The crescent becomes narrower and narrower. Now there's only a tiny sliver of crescent left. And then for over five minutes, we had the wonderful sight of totality, with the moon blocking out the sun completely. And we had that lovely view of the sun's atmosphere, which we call the corona, made up of intensely rarefied gas at a very high temperature, although there's not much actual heat there. And it is, in fact, expanding. And it has no hard and sharp boundary. It simply thins out into space until you can't detect it any longer. And then there is the solar wind made up of streams of particles coming out from the sun all the time in all directions. And uh, the solar wind particles can make themselves felt in many ways. For example, they affect the tails of comets. When a comet's coming in toward the sun, the solar wind forces the tail so that it points away from the sun, as that of Halley's Comet will do as it comes into the sun towards perihelion in February 1986. And the tail will then still be pointing away from the sun, and on the outward journey, the tail will actually go first and that's mainly the effect of the solar wind. And then solar wind particles can enter the zones of charged particles surrounding the Earth, the so-called Van Allen zones, overload them, and particles then cascade down into the upper air, producing those lovely glows we call aurorae, and that also is due to the solar wind. And I suppose we can say that the heliosphere, and that's the boundary where the sun's influence is dominant, ends when you can no longer detect the solar winds. And that's a long way out. Up to now, we've never known how far, because we've never been able to send anything there. But now we can, and two probes, pioneers 10 and 11, are sending back information about the outer part of the heliosphere. Now, the first of these uh, was Pioneer 10, and that was launched in 1972. I talked about it then at length, because its main job was to go and take the first really good look at the planet Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is visible in the evening sky now, rather low down, and with a telescope, you can see its belts and its four bright moons. But Pioneer 10 sent back really close-up pictures, including this one, which shows the red spot. It was followed by Pioneer 11, which did the same kind of thing, but didn't follow quite the same path. Now, Pioneer 10, remember, launched into March 72, uh, actually went past Jupiter, and then began a never-ending journey out of the solar system. It will not come back. And uh, in eight, late April this year, it reached a distance from the sun equal to the present distance of Pluto, bearing in mind that Pluto, at the moment, is closer in than Neptune. And then, on 13th of June this year, only a little while ago now, Pioneer 10 crossed the orbit of Neptune. And so it's now the furthest probe we've ever tracked. Pioneer 11 was rather different. Uh, that went off a year later. It bypassed Jupiter, sending back pictures. And it was then given an extra impetus, which sent it past Saturn, and it obtained the first pictures from there, before it also started a never-ending journey out of the solar system. So note that those two probes are now going out of the solar system in opposite directions, and we are still in touch with them. And with any luck, we'll be able to follow them till at least 1991, when Pioneer 10 will be something like 5,000 million miles away from the sun, and the Pioneer 11 not much less than that. And this is going to be extremely valuable because we are now getting information back from the outer part of the heliosphere. Now, I'm not really a sun man, and so I'm delighted to welcome back to this guy at night somebody who is, Ian Nicholson. Welcome back, Ian. Now, what exactly do we know about the heliosphere? Well, really, the heliosphere is a kind of magnetic bubble. It uh, extends out, uh, carried by the influence of the solar wind and the sun's magnetic field. And inside this bubble, the sun's magnetic field is stronger and has a greater effect than the magnetic field of the galaxy and the weak interstellar gas that lies between the stars. Now, really to get a better impression of what the, uh, mag uh, the sun's magnetosphere is like, I think we've got to think a little bit more about the solar wind. Yeah. And the solar wind emerges from the, the corona. And the thing about the corona, when you see it in a, a nice picture like this one that Patrick took of the recent total eclipse, is that it looks like a rather uniform atmosphere around the sun. But spacecraft, of course, shows a very different view uh, from above the atmosphere. Because the temperature of the corona is so very high, it actually emits x-rays at a temperature of maybe about 5 million degrees. And if we use spacecraft, which are above the atmosphere, looking at these x-rays, then we get a view rather like this one, which was taken from the American Skylab back in the early 1970s. 
And we see that the corona is far from being uniform, that it, uh, it consists of very concentrated bright blobs, which are uh, high temperature gas bound to the sun by its magnetic field, but also these dark patches, which are known appropriately as coronal holes, and out of these patches, material literally flows out into inter interplanetary space. And it's from these holes, particularly the holes at the poles, that most of the solar wind emerges. But sometimes, as indeed here, the coronal holes can extend right down uh, to the equator of the sun. Now, in addition to the coronal holes, we, can, we have, of course, violent events on the surface of the sun itself, yes, violent events such as flares and... Uh, erupting prominences which throw great bursts of particles out into interplanetary space and these plow through the slower moving solar wind causing great shock waves and making the solar wind very turbulent and gusty as it blows past the earth. Now the amount of uh, material that's flowing out of the sun is really quite prodigious. It's over a million tons per second but of course it would take the, the sun something like 10 million million years to evaporate in this sort of way and it's going to die of natural causes long before that. So no immediate cause for alarm? No immediate cause for alarm. And of course the wind itself consists mainly of protons and electrons, the basic atomic particles. And these are moving out at a fair old speed. They're passing the earth at about 400 kilometers a second, which is about a million miles an hour. Now they're not very dense. There's only about five of these particles to each cubic centimeter of space. And that's about one ten million million millionth of the density of air at ground level. But because they're moving fast and because of their electric charge, they can have significant effects here on the Earth. And in particular, they have an influence on the Earth's magnetic field. We can think of the Earth as if it had a bar magnet inside with lines of force of the magnetic field spreading outwards. Uh, and the effect of the solar wind is to distort the Earth's magnetic field and form it into a closed magnetosphere. Here, of course, the sun is over to the right of the picture and the solar wind is coming in from the right. That's right. The solar wind particles stream in from the right, they bump into the Earth's magnetosphere, and there they encounter a, a kind of a shock wave, rather like the, the bow wave of a ship going through the ocean or the, the shock wave set up by a supersonic aircraft. And uh, that distorts the magnetosphere. It squeezes it up on the sun-facing side and draws it out into a long tail extending perhaps a six million kilometers on the far side, rather like the tail of a comet. Or a teardrop, come to that. Uh, very much uh, in the shape of a teardrop. Now, one of the things that Pioneer 10 was able to show was that uh, the magnetosphere of Jupiter is vastly greater than that of the Earth and it's distorted in the same sort of way, and the magnetotail of Jupiter's magnetosphere in fact extends beyond the orbit of Saturn. So Saturn can sometimes be inside it, because Jupiter is a lethal planet with very deadly radiation zones around it. Well, Pioneer's past that area now, and um, what about the news from the, the outer heliosphere itself? Well, Pioneer's doing extraordinarily well. One of its instruments, the mag magnetometer, failed in 1975, but the rest are still functioning and still sending back data. So the big question that Pioneer may provide the answer to is just how far does the solar wind blow? Yes. And where does it stop? Because eventually the solar wind and indeed the sun's magnetic field must be contained, being held in by the very weak pressure exerted by the interstellar gas and the interstellar magnetic field. And that really marks the boundary of the heliosphere. That really marks the, the boundary of the heliosphere. Now the boundary we call the, uh, the heliopause and uh, astronomers have wondered for a very long time about just how far away this boundary lies. 20 years ago, ideas were very varied. There were some astronomers who felt that it lay perhaps at the distance of Jupiter. Others thought it was perhaps 20 or 30 times further away than that. Although, to be fair, the majority thought it was reasonably close in. Yeah. And what Pioneer 10 has clearly demonstrated is that the heliopause lies well beyond the planet Neptune which is represented in this uh, animation here by the small white dot. Now, one of the things about the uh, boundary, about the heliopause, is that it will be affected by the interstellar gas. It will be molded into shape because the sun, after all, is moving through interstellar space at about 20 kilometers a second. And this will, as with the uh, magnetosphere of the Earth, it will cause it to be uh, squashed up at the front and drawn out into something of a tail at the back. Now, one of the things that the uh, sun's heliosphere does is to act as a barrier to electrically charged particles. Uh, the cosmic rays, uh, charged atomic nuclei approaching us from beyond the solar system, really find it quite difficult to penetrate into the heliosphere. 
Uh, some of them get through, admittedly, but uh, when the sun is highly active, most of them get reflected back into space. And then when the sun's activity drops, then the cosmic rays find it easier to get into the inner parts of the solar system. Now, Pioneer 10 is going off, unfortunately, rather down the tail of the heliosphere. And so it's got a long way to go before it actually reaches the heliopause. Yes, and indeed. Chances are it may not be communicating by the time it gets there. But Pioneer 11, on the other hand, is going off in the opposite direction towards the bow shock of the helios heliosphere. And so it's got considerably less distance to travel before reaching the boundary. And there must be good odds that it will get across the boundary before we do lose communication. Now, another thing about the heliosphere, we believe that its size is going to vary with the solar activity cycle. When the sun is highly active and the solar wind is strong and gusty, it will inflate the heliosphere to a, a large extended and distended blob. But when activity declines, then the whole heliosphere will shrink to a simple egg shape. And as it goes in and out in this sort of way, an intriguing possibility is that the boundary, the heliopause, will actually pass over the Pioneer spacecraft several times as the uh, heliosphere moves in and out. And indeed, we saw a similar sort of thing happen when Pioneer went past Jupiter. Now, if it is possible that we get some data showing this kind of effect, then its importance can hardly be overestimated. Well, it is all rather unexpected, and I think a great many people were really surprised to find that events on the sun itself have such a profound effect upon the outer heliosphere, which is so, such a long way away. Well, that's right, and uh, the reverberations, the shock waves that, that shoot out from storms on the surface of the sun, pioneers shown that these things reverberate around the heliosphere for perhaps a year, causing the whole thing to shimmer and shake rather like a jelly. All kinds of things are coming through. What else? Well, pioneers shown that the speed of the solar wind doesn't slow down. Most astronomers had thought that the particles would collide with each other and lose energy, but in fact they keep streaming out on out at the same sort of speed uh, all the way. Amongst the other things that it's uh, shown is that the magnetic field of the sun gets wound up into a very tight and turbulent spiral, so the whole thing's rather like a buckled gramophone record. And another thing of considerable interest is that it has been able to detect particles of interstellar gas flowing into the solar system, hydrogen and helium. And the curious thing about this is that the gas is coming in along the line of the planets. Now, this is not the direction which the sun itself is moving, that's about 60 degrees away from the direction in which the sun is moving, and that's the way that we would expect the gas to be coming. So why it's coming in the direction that's observed is something of a mystery. Now, I find that very difficult to understand. We may find out, I don't know. But meanwhile, what about the longer-term outlook? Well, of course, we live inside the heliosphere, so in a sense, Pioneer is exploring our environment in the widest use of that term. But uh, the really exciting thing will be if one of the Pioneers does get through the heliopause and sends us back data, because not only will that tell us how large the sun's domain really is, but it will, for the first time, give us information about real interstellar space, unpolluted by the effects of the solar wind. Yes. So we'll find out how many cosmic rays exist in, in the galaxy and how much interstellar gas there really is uh, out beyond that boundary. There's another point that interests me very much, and we did, in fact, discuss it on the Sky at Night program a little while ago. I think I suggested it way back about 1974. Um, as these probes, the pioneers, go out to the solar system in opposite directions, we're still in touch with them, and it may well be that one or both will be perturbed by some unknown body. Well, I think many people, include myself, think there probably is another planet going around the sun outside the paths of Neptune and Pluto, and it's just possible that one or both of the pioneers might lead us to it. It's a long shot, but it's not out of the question. And then, looking further ahead still, what about the final fate of these pioneers? Well, I think one of the problems is when do you define the instant when Pioneer has left the solar system? Some would argue that Pioneer 10 already has done so because it's beyond Neptune, but it's still inside the heliosphere. And even when it crosses out of the heliosphere, it will still be inside the so-called Oort cloud, this vast reservoir of comets that's believed to extend around us to a distance of perhaps about a light year. And incidentally, in this view, the actual heliosphere uh, covers an area very much smaller than the dot representing the sun. Not very much. So Pioneer's got a long way to go, and it'll take it perhaps 30,000 years to get clear uh, of the Oort cloud. Well, and what about close encounters with other stars? Well, Pioneer's moving away at the moment at about 49,000 kilometers per hour. That's going to drop a little bit to about 40,000, but it's going to move away steadily at that sort of speed forevermore. Now, the nearest star, of course, is Proxima Centauri, just over four light-years away, 
And if Pioneer were heading in that direction, it would take it roughly 100,000 years to cover that distance. But it's not. Well, of course, it's not going that way, but it is heading in the general direction of Aldebaran, the, the well-known red, orange star in the constellation of Taurus. And uh, we can see Aldebaran here in the top of the picture and the sun towards the bottom left. And uh, Pioneer's moving out, admittedly, quite fast. But of course, uh, Aldebaran is moving away about five times faster than Pioneer itself is moving. So By stellar standards, Pioneer's a cosmic snail. It's an absolute snail. And this, I think, is an interesting point, because um, what is really going to determine any close encounters with stars is not so much the speed of Pioneer itself, but the speed at which the nearby stars are moving. Really, we can regard Pioneer as being like a pedestrian trying to cross the road full of busy traffic, or somebody in a rowing boat trying to row through the shipping lanes. It's the speed of the stars that really matter. Now, the first really close encounter, if you can use that term, uh, is going to occur in about 32,000 years' time. And that's with a dull red star known as Ross 248, which lies in the constellation of Andromeda, about 60 degrees away from the direction in which uh, Pioneer is heading. But Ross 248 is coming our way at about 80 kilometers per second, and it's going to pass from above the orbit of Pioneer to below it, making its closest approach in 32,610 years, and thereafter it will pass within about three light years of the sun uh, a little time later. What next? Well, the next uh, encounter, or the first encounter with uh, a reasonably bright star, will be in about 227,000 years' time, and that's with uh, Altair. And again, of course, the term close encounter is a bit misleading because it will only pass within about six light years of Altair. But there's Altair in the well-known summer triangle made up of Deneb, Vega, uh, and Altair. And Altair is a rather different kind of star from the sun. It's uh, somewhat hotter. It's rotating rather rapidly on its axis. And at, its, at the present time, it's at a distance of about 10 light years. But Pioneer will get somewhat closer to it than we do. Well, I don't think Altair is at all the kind of star likely to have inhabited planets going around. It's not that kind of star at all. But um, just in case any alien race does find Pioneer 10, it carries a plaque. And that plaque has always rather intrigued me. I don't know about you. Yes, it's a work of art, really. The, the idea is to show humanoid creatures to scale against a, a drawing of the spacecraft itself. And then along the bottom, you can see that the spacecraft came away from the third planet and went by means of the fifth planet. But perhaps the most interesting thing is this converging set of radial lines on the left-hand side there, which is supposed to locate the solar system in space and time by reference to the, the nearby pulsars, these pulsating radio sources, which presumably would be known to other alien intelligences as well. So what worries me about that is that the pioneer is going to take a long, long time to get there, and pulsars may be fairly short-lived on the cosmic scale. Well, that's right, so that the times of them will have changed, but it may be possible to use their timings to date back to when the Pioneer was launched. Well, the one thing I'm afraid that we shan't know is whether Pioneer 10 or Pioneer 11 will ever be collected by an alien civilization. But I think as a measure of our changed attitude, it's been thought worthy of doing at all. Ian, thank you very much indeed. So, there we have it. Both the Pioneers, even if they do know more, have must be regarded as outstanding successes. They are still functioning, they are still sending back information. And I just wonder whether either or both will locate a planet beyond Neptune and Pluto, and if so, whether it would look anything like this drawing by Paul Doherty. I have a sort of feeling it's there, whether we're going to find it, and whether the pioneers are going to help us is something that remains to be seen. Anyway, they're going to have a try. Um, I said I'd give you the address of the newsletter, and here it is again. And send stamped arrest envelope to newsletter number 10, The Sky at Night, BBC Television, London, W12, 8 QT. And do please remember two things. If you don't send a stamped address envelope, I'm afraid you won't get a newsletter. And please, don't put personal letters inside, because those are the ones that go astray. But um, I hope you'll find the newsletter useful. And uh, from Ian, and myself, and from the pioneers, good night. That edition of The Sky at Night will be repeated next Saturday at 6.50 on BBC Two. And the next one can be seen here on One on Sunday, the 31st of July.